And with that, I'm going to stop talking and introduce our, our first speaker, who is Paul Roberti, a commissioner from Rhode Island Public Utilities Commission. He's also the chairman of the Pipeline Safety Subcommittee for the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners. That's a mouthful. Um, and uh, Paul's been involved with pipeline safety for years. We're not going to go through everybody's bios. They're in your packet if you're interested, because um, we want to just stay on time. But uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Paul Roberti, who's going to give us some perspectives on pipeline safety, kind of from the State Utility Commission's viewpoint. Uh, Mr. Roberti, let me f find a... Uh can see I have more work to do on our website. We, at least we were <laughs> I, w I wasn't going to point that out. I the page, I and I talked to those folks. There are some easy fixes, but apparently they didn't listen to me. <clears throat> okay. Do you mind if I put this like this? That's fine. Okay. okay. Good morning, and thank you. Uh, as Carl said, I serve as chairman of the NARIC Subcommittee on Pipeline Safety, and I'm also a commissioner at the Rhode Island Public Utilities Commission. On behalf of NARIC, I want to personally thank you for the invitation to be here today. And Carl, I want to thank you personally for all you've done in the name of safety. Under your leadership, the Pipeline Safety Trust has become an authoritative organization representing the public. You, your staff, your members continue to advance the mission of safety and shining a bright light on this issue. And I can tell you that at NARIC and, our, and at NAPSER, uh, we hear you loud and clear, and I believe we share a common goal, ensuring that our regulated public utilities provide for the safe and reliable delivery of their services. This morning I'm going to talk about uh, five areas. First, the importance of NARIC's efforts as a catalyst for ensuring that the regulatory system is sound. And then I'm going to turn to industry and industry's fundamental responsibilities. Then I'll talk about the public and the role of the public, uh, how important the role of the public is. Fourth, the role of state regulators and the challenges we face with aging infrastructure. And lastly, I'll speak briefly about how these efforts dovetail with the environmental goals of reducing methane emissions. First, about NERA. We are a national organization representing all 50 states, their regulators, and their staffs. Our goal is to provide a healthy and predictable regulatory environment that ensures just and reasonable rates for the safe and reliable delivery of utility services, including natural gas, electricity, telecommunications, water, and many other services. NARIC offers educational opportunities and facilitates the sharing of best practices, all aimed at improving regulation and serving the public interest. After Sam Bruno in Allentown, and consistent with uh, former Transportation Secretary Ray LaHood's call to action, we established a task force on pipeline safety. And then we institutionalized our commitment to this issue by creating a permanent subcommittee on pipeline safety, which I now chair. The subcommittee meets three times a year at our NARIC meetings, where we bring about a dozen or more commissioners from across the nation, along with pipeline safety staff, to review recent incidents and share best practices. Our gas committee has held a session on pipeline safety at every meeting at NARIC since 2010 after those tragedies occurred. And Carl can attest to this because he joined us in Dallas at our summer meetings uh, this past July. At NARIC, we've endeavored to cover a host of topics, including finding new ways to communicate with the public, focusing on rate-making policies, that encourage infrastructure replacement, building a culture of safety, and highlighting new technologies and management practices, among others. I'll go into further detail on the issue of infrastructure investment in a few moments. But first, I want to talk about what I think are the three pillars of safety that form a culture of safety. Industry, public, and regulators. Each represents a vital component of the foundation underlying a safe and reliable delivery system. What each segment does and how effectively they work together determines the fate of our safety culture. 
And in my view, the state of the safety culture correlates directly to the likelihood of incidents and the potential for property damage, injuries, or at worst, fatalities. First, the industry. I'll start by saying that the first defense against any pipeline incident is a proactive utility. The utilities are first and foremost responsible for the safety of their systems and their customers. They own the pipes and should know what parts of the system are most vulnerable and in need of replacement. That requires knowing the age, location, the characteristics of every component of the system. It requires close coordination with both the public and local emergency responders so they know what to do in the event of an incident. It requires informed knowledge about the risk to the public and what should be done to cost effectively mitigate that risk. It requires the execution of long-term investment strategies to ensure that the system and, it, and any single component of the system does not become so old or compromised as to create systemic risk to the public. And it also requires the development and presentation to state regulators like myself of detailed capital programs and replacement plans that provide the necessary justification to increase rates so that the utilities get the cost recovery necessary to maintain a safe and reliable system. As age and risk accrue with the passage of time, like traveling in a moving car, this essential utility obligation must be fulfilled by looking out the front window rather than the rear view mirror in reaction to bad consequences like San Bruno, Allentown, East Harlem, and many of the other tragic incidents we've endured. The second pillar, the public. A well-informed public breeds strength and safety. Despite issues with aged in infrastructure, the most common cause of pipeline incidents remains accidents by third parties. This means we must double down on our 811 one-call efforts so that everyone knows what to do before they dig. It also means finding new and effective ways to inform customers about what they should do when they smell gas. And while it is a little troubling that we rely so heavily on a person's nose to detect a gas leak, the reality is that even with the most modernized system, the consumer's role will remain vital because the gas system ends in their home or apartment building and always will. Lastly, the public must know and understand what needs to be done to maintain a modernized pipeline system. After all, they have to pay the rates and charges. And the failure to understand breeds discontent and political opposition when the rates have to increase to support necessary investments. Next, the regulatory, com the regulatory community and aged infrastructure. The states are partners with the Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration, the federal agency which reimburses us for much of the pipeline safety work we do. And I know Jeff Weiss is here and Alan Mayberry, and I want to commend Jeff on his laser focus on safety and instilling a, a culture of safety. Uh, it was Jeff that got me to go to East Harlem last March to, to visit the site of that incident. And things like that live, live with you forever and inform me today and actually inform these comments that I delivered to you today. Every state participating in PHMSA's safety program must meet or exceed PHMSA's requirements, and most states do. And as a recent NAPSER report uh, that we update every other year indicates, the states have adopted more than 1,360 safety rules that go above and beyond the minimum standards. And this report is available both on the NAPSER and NARIC websites for anyone interested. NAPSER officials like Robert Miller and David Lykin, and I know Peter Chase and Darren Burke are going to be here as well, are dedicated in and a competent workforce in the field advancing the mission of safety. And I know this from personal experience. I've gone out in the field with these folks, I've surveyed their work, and I've attended numerous meetings with them. Along with the commissioners, 
They embody and represent NARIC. They are constantly out in the field, poring over documents, inspecting system components, overseeing pipeline projects, checking qualifications, and much more to make sure that gas companies are following federal and state safety requirements. And they're also among the first responders when something goes wrong and help to determine why an incident happened and who or what may have been responsible. But it bears repeating, the first defense is industry. The regulators can never do as much as industry itself. On to infrastructure replacement. As you probably know, one of the most significant issues we face today is aged infrastructure. And it's not evenly distributed across the nation. For instance, 83% of the cast iron inventory lies in just 10 states. And in all fairness, some utilities have done a better job than others at tackling this issue. But no matter how we arrived at this point, the states recognize that vintage materials like cast iron and beer steel bring heightened risk, and every day that passes, the risk to the public increases. That is why at NARIC we've been so actively engaged in promoting infrastructure replacement programs. And we adopted a resolution that urges state commissions to consider alternative, alternative rate recovery mechanisms if it's determined that such mechanisms, including surcharges, are necessary to expedite the replacement of outdated infrastructure. But there is a sobering reality. As much as we'd like to replace every single mile of cast iron and beer steel mains tomorrow, it's going to take time because the most challenged systems lie in urban areas and it requires extensive logistical coordination with public works departments and other utilities. And second is the magnitude of the cost. At a recent uh, estimate of one to three million dollars per mile for replacement, the cost could run as high as a quarter of a trillion dollars or more. Now on a positive note, I think we've seen substantial progress over the years and more so recently. Since 1990, more than 65,000 miles of cast iron and beer steel has been replaced with polyethylene. But we have a long, long way to go. 30,746 miles of cast iron remaining, 34,660 miles, miles of beer steel mains remaining to be replaced. And the hardest question is how long will it take? We have to complete this task because there will be new challenges and growing risks ahead, like compromised plastics and whatever the future holds that we don't know right now. We have much to do and the pace of progress is critical. To me, it's akin to running a marathon where the route is defined by the age, material, location, and the condition of those system components and the pace is defined by the magnitude of the risk to the public. But this isn't an ordinary race. Because first, we absolutely have to finish. We have no choice. And equally important, we must finish with a respectable time. Because we can't leave this age infrastructure out there for decades upon decades. Lastly, I want to address the issue of methane emissions and environmental quality. Aged cast iron beer steel mains are prone to leaks, and the White House and many interest groups view pipeline replacement as an effective way to reduce methane emissions. NARIC, recent, NARIC recently participated in several meetings with the White House and the Department of Energy to discuss this issue, and we announced a partnership with the Department of Energy that will provide technical assistance and additional tools to help us to discover and evaluate leaks. While the partnership is still in its infancy, we are hopeful that it will ultimately bring about some innovative approaches and deployment of new technologies for measuring leaks and furthering our collective mission of modernizing the nation's pipeline system. Although our focus as economic and safety regulators remains primarily on the safe and reliable operation of the pipeline system, reducing methane emissions will be a natural outcome of our work to expedite infrastructure replacement. After all, a safe system 
is a clean and efficient system. Uh, so in concluding, I want to thank you again for the opportunity to be here today. NARIC looks forward to continued engagement with the Safety Trust since we share a common goal of improving the safety of our pipelines. I wish you all a productive uh, conference over the next two days, and I'd be very happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, thank you again.